yep. much. Uh, I mean, I was I wore this instead of it going uh, mm -hmm. thermal. Right. I won uh, Insular, which is uh, uh, Under Armour. Yeah. You know, so they, they it just squeezes you, you tight. Right. Yeah, you wore a onesie. No, I didn't go onesie. Uh, you were wearing a girdle. Right. No, no, I was just wearing. Like it. I was wearing specs. the tight version of Under Armour, almost mm. the first version from 1982. Mm. So together, I think I un, I uh, actually got warm about an hour ago. Some people call them Spanx. <laughs> I do not wear Spanx. <laughs> I'm going to reveal a story. Uh, the way I kept cold, uh, warm because it was so cold, is I took two pairs of shoes yesterday. Yes. And every 20 minutes, uh, I would put the shoes next to the big furnace that we had up in the tent. Here's the problem. 7:45 yesterday, I picked up the shoes. <laughs> they had melted. The no, whatever kidding? keeps the sole to the, the shoe had disconnected. Melted. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's why we should have a shoemaker on staff or a blacksmith, <laughs> right? It to put that back together. Grateful, grateful for our staff because our staff. We sat there for three hours. Yeah. They had to be there for hours before to set all right. of that up, and hours after. But unlike Excuse our staff, too. we had to be sober. We've got some <laughs> pictures we're going to show you in a little while, but in the meantime, will we see that FISA memo later today? There's a possibility that there's a Reuters story out. Apparently, they talked to somebody at the White House. The memo released regarding FISA abuses at the Department of Justice and the FBI could be released today, although uh, it sounds like the White House uh, Chief Counsel and the National Security Council also are reviewing I bet we don't see it till Monday. Well, the House uh, voted. The House voted on Monday night, and then the president has five days. Yeah. So that means Saturday night, or is it five working days, which would be Monday? I would think, though, I was thinking about this last night. He might not release it until Monday, right. so the Sunday shows can focus on his speech. Yeah, well, they'll still focus on the memo, though. In the perfect world, that would be great. But the the speech was already almost out, off the headlines because the FBI pushed back on Devin Nunes's memo. So I think it's important to actually give you the foundation of this. Devin Nunes, who was chairman of Oversight, he sees this uh, material that he thinks should go public. He can't believe it, and next thing you know, he's under an ethics investigation. So the the Oversight Committee, uh, Intelligence Committee, asked. The FBI, can you give me some of this information? The FBI ignores, ignores, ignores. It took a subpoena to get this information to come forward in front of the Intelligence Committee, right. which to me is inexcusable. When it does come forward, Devin Nunes says, you know what? I'm going to just write up a summary. I'm going to give it to the president to let the people know what went into the investigation of the Trump organization leading up to the, the election and afterwards, at which time the, the memo arrives at the White House where the FBI director on Sunday takes a look at it. On Monday, we didn't think he had a problem with it. Yesterday, five FBI agents show up. They look at it and they said, hey, Chief Kelly, we got a problem with this. They, he goes, what's your problem? He makes some changes. They make some gra grammatical changes, says Devin Nunes. So at that time, he makes some changes. He thinks it's for the better. The FBI is still not happy. And guess who else isn't happy? Adam Schiff. He says, you've changed the memo that I okayed. Right, and he's su suggesting, look, he's done all he can, Adam Schiff, to keep it from coming out. Nonetheless, the FBI and the Department of Justice are hitting the panic button because they don't want it out. Uh, the, here is what the Department of Justice released. They said, with regard to the House Intelligence Committee's memorandum, the FBI was provided a limited opportunity to review this memo the day before the committee voted to release it. That was on Sunday. That's when Chris Way Ray went over to the Capitol. As expressed during our initial review, we gave grave concerns about material omissions of fact that fundamentally impact the memo's accuracy. And then the next day, after Chris Ray saw it, five guys went over, they looked at it. Next thing you know, they got some suggestions, they made it, and Adam Schiff is saying, oh, they changed everything. They actually made some changes that Democrats asked well, Nunes, for. of course, is saying, he's saying the FBI doesn't want this released because it shows the abuse of power within right. that agency. He also said this, having stonewalled Congress's demands for information for nearly a year, it's no surprise to see the FBI and the DOJ issue spurious objections to allowing the American people to see information related to surveillance abuses at these agencies. Right. So, so he's the, saying he's not surprised because so the, they've stonewalled everything for a year. So yeah. the question is, is the FBI concerned about the relationship of intelligence as it relates to the Intelligence Committee and, uh, and uh, methods and practices, or are they worried it's going to make them look terrible and individuals in particular look awful, and is that what they're here to stop? When Devin Nunes says, yeah, I think it's the latter because 
Why else would they be stopping us as the Intelligence Committee from getting this information for months? Why did I have right. to go through the courts to get this intelligence to begin with? Well, here's the thing, because they did make some changes. There are some on the left who said, OK, we didn't vote for that version. Of course, they all voted against it anyway. You're going to have to have a revote. If they do have a revote, which 50-50 chance right now on what uh, would be released to the public, the earliest they could have it is on Monday, because remember, half of Congress is out in West Virginia. That's Good right. Good point. That's right. Meanwhile, the Democrats continue to have a meltdown about the president's first State of the Union address. You know, you saw their faces. You saw the grim looks. You saw that they didn't stand up when the parents of a family lost their child to MS-13, was uh, given recognition for the courage to come forward and the need to push back on this international gang operation. But again, it's a little confusing. We thought Joe Kennedy gave the official response response to the State of the Union as tradition. But it turns out a lot of people gave a response to the State of the Union. Unlike tradition. Yeah, Nancy Pelosi said it was insulting to call it chain migration, that she prefers family reunification. Maxine Waters is using the race card. She says the president is racist. She's the one who kept calling for impeachment. Listen to this. This is from last night. One speech cannot and does not make Donald Trump presidential. He's not presidential. And he never will be presidential. He claims that he's bringing people together, but make no mistake, he is a dangerous, unprincipled, divisive, and shameful racist. Trump often works to convince dissatisfied elements in our society that all of their problems are caused by people of color. Okay, so there you've got Maxine Waters issuing her rebuttal on BET. Uh, regarding the actual State of the Union, uh, I think 45 million watched it on all the television channels. I think uh, Barack Obama's final one was seen by about 15 million less than that. But keep in mind, the longer you're in office, the more, uh, the fewer people watch. The number one cable outfit was Fox News Channel. It was also the number one outfit that Americans turned to. We had over 11 million. It is the highest rating in cable history when it comes to the State of the Unions, and we have to thank you for turning yes. us on. Also, when it, so comes to, yeah, when it comes to social media, 21 million interactions across Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, 21 million uh, measured, 41% occurred on Facebook, 7% on Instagram, 52% on the pre president's favorite vehicle, and that is Twitter. It was so the most tweeted State of the Union ever. And the reason we tell you this is because it's obvious that Many people around the country, millions of people around the country, want to hear what this president has to say. Mm -hmm. Many people are on board with him, despite what you might hear from Maxine Waters or from Nancy Pelosi. Right. Not everyone agrees with him, but he does have a lot of support. And they need to keep that in mind because they have big elections coming sure. up come right. November. And the thing about uh, the elections is keep in mind yesterday we had uh, Lee Carter on and she tested some of the sound bites from the president. and. The Republicans gave him good grades, but the independents, the people who actually move elections and determine who our president would be, more closely aligned to the Republicans now than the Democrats. And that is not good for the Democrats who are saying yeah. it's a slam dunk, it's over, show's over. Uh, you know, Paul Ryan, mm -hmm. give us your hammer. Yesterday, Fox, you had a big guest on radio. Yeah, and on FoxNews.com, Frank Luntz came out and says, I apologize to the president. Uh, I, you know, in the beginning, he was an anti Trumper. He listened to that speech and thought he just hit it out of the park. Mm -hmm. Frank Luntz, the uh, pollster. Meanwhile, uh, this is a big story that our producer was able to uncover. There was this high school teacher talking to a bunch of 17-year-olds, at which time he noticed one of the students wearing a Marine shirt, and he commented about the lack of intellect among those who serve in America's military. Here is now suspended teacher with pay, Greg Salcedo. We've got a bunch of dumb Think about the people who you know are over there. Your freaking stupid Uncle Louie or whatever, they're dumb they're not like high level thinkers, they're not academic people, they're not intellectual people. They're the freaking lowest of our low, not morally. You know, I'm not saying they, they make bad moral decisions, just they're not talented people. So, so the yesterday. big question is what's going to happen to him last night out in his school district. 150 people showed up demanding answers. The school board, though, is kind of in a pickle because currently they don't have an attorney. So the main thing the school board did last night was they said, OK, we need an attorney and we need one fast. They put him on administrative leave until they can figure out what to do. So yesterday I played this for uh, the chief of staff, General Kelly. We had a chance to bring the radio show to the White House. He heard it for the first time. Then I read it to him because he couldn't make out some of the audio. And this is the response that we can play on television. 
What is your reaction to that, knowing that these are, he's teaching a bunch of 17-year-olds yeah. this? Well, I think the guy ought to go to hell. Um, I just hope he enjoys the, the liberties and the, and the lifestyle that, uh, that we have uh, fought for. Yeah, and he got he got angrier and angrier, and we had to dump some of his response. He makes, because he makes an excellent point. He lost his own son fighting for our country. He said he has gone down to Arlington and walked, you know, down those down through all the graves, and, and said, "I because of my decisions, a lot of these people are here." He takes this very seriously, as as most of us do, mm -hmm. and most of us should, all of us should. But um, he's saying this guy has the freedom to teach in the classroom because of what these men and women have done. And the, the guy's a government and history teacher. So what form of government and history teaching is he teaching? Teaching these 17-year-olds. We've got uh, one of the kids from that class, the kid, uh, Victor Quinones, the student who taped that teacher. He's going to be joining us at 8.20 Eastern time right here exclusively on Fox & Friends. We'll hear from you how he felt when the teacher went off on people who serve That's an exclusive. He hasn't talked to anyone yet. That's right. All right. Uh, 612 here in New York City. President Obama wanted to shut Gitmo down, but President Trump just made good on another one of his campaign promises. He's going to keep it open. Dr. James Mitchell interrogated the mastermind of 9-11. He's live next. Plus, you saw them at the State of the Union, parents who lost their children to MS-13, but MSNBC doesn't think that's a problem. He gives a speech tonight in which he makes it sound like the biggest issue in the United States, uh, the biggest threat is MS-13, a gang nobody that doesn't watch Fox News has ever heard of. The mom of one of those murdered children is firing back. Announcing during his State of the Union address to the surprise of many that he fulfilled another one of his campaign pledges. Listen. So today I'm keeping another promise to re-examine our military detention policy and to keep open the detention facilities in Guantanamo Bay. Half the room applauded. So why is leaving Gitmo open so essential to keeping America safe? Joining us right now to weigh in is a true expert on this matter, the author of Enhanced Interrogation, Dr. James Mitchell, who interrogated some of the worst terrorists in the world, some are still at Gitmo. Dr. Mitchell, what was your reaction when you heard that? I was pleased. You know, I was concerned that we were going to try to do something to move it out of the realms of being an unlawful act of war and move it towards being a criminal enterprise, a civilian criminal enterprise. I don't think we should do that. I think that would make us less safe. And there were two things that he said about that, keeping, keeping Gitmo open and continuing to treat these uh, terror attacks uh, outside of our country as unlawful acts of war. I think those are important policies. So you know the counter argument. And the reason why half the room sat is because they say it's a symbol for terrorists to mobilize. You have Gitmo. That's where they put us. Now we have to really hate America. <laughs> My reaction is, you know, I talked to a lot of terrorists. I doubt that anybody sitting in that room, other than maybe some of the military and some of the intelligence community, actually has talked to a terrorist. I haven't talked to a single terrorist who told me that they were attacking us because of Gitmo. They're attacking us because they find our way of life repulsive mm -hmm. and they want to destroy it and their, and their religious ideology. And in fact, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11 said, Gitmo is just used as a recruiting tool. If it wasn't Gitmo, it would be something else. Wow, he told you that. So uh, President Bush right. transferred 500 out. 197 detainees uh, out uh, were by President Obama. We're left with 41. Five have been cleared for release by the previous administration. The question is, when we get them, how do we effectively interrogate them? Is your way the right way that we should be using now? I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, here, here's my honest reaction to that. My honest reaction to that is... I don't think enhanced interrogation is necessary for 99.5% of the people, uh, the terrorists that we capture. But for that one half of 1% who has information that could stop a catastrophic attack inside of the United States that involves nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons, I think we ought to leave everything on the table. And I don't think that we're doing that now. And my concern about the... Um, uh, Army field manual is that it's on the internet, 
it describes the techniques, it tells people how they're thought to work, and it emphasizes the need to get voluntary admissions, mm -hmm. voluntary information. And what I would ask people is, do you really want to wager the safety of your family on the bet that a terrorist whose God sent him there to kill you is willing to provide voluntarily information mm -hmm. to stop those attacks. I don't think we should. Nope. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, very important uh, things to bring up. Also, when we talk about immigration and the visa lottery system, a couple of those guys came through the visa lottery system. So, straight ahead. Republican lawmakers bring into action after their train slams into a garbage truck. All were stunned by this. In West Virginia, we're back with the Fox News alert. We now know the identity of that person killed when a garbage truck collided with that Amtrak train packed with half of Congress in it. All the Republican lawmakers traveling to a resort were on that train. The NTSB now taking over that investigation, trying to figure out exactly what went wrong. All right. Jeff, uh, Griff Jenkins is still at the scene right now uh, in Virginia with the breaking details. Griff, behind you is the wreckage. That's right. Good morning. The identity, by the way, of that fatality, Christopher Foley, 28 years old. But look at this debris field behind me. You see the trash truck, the trash strewn all along the embankment as you work your way up to that rail crossing. The cab of that truck smashed where Mr. Foley, along with two others, were in there, one critically injured, one with minor injuries. And the NTSB working hard on this scene as they have all night. We went to the press conference last night and spoke with the spokesman, Earl Wayner. Here Here's what he had to say about the investigation. We expect this to take several days of on-scene work, followed by months back at headquarters. If we find anything that indicates that this is when it was intentional, uh, we will turn that over to the FBI. Amtrak says, guys, far too common, the wrecks and crashes in railways just like this, but the real remarkable story, those GOP congressmen turned first responders when the impact happened. Guys? Exactly right. All right, Griff, thank you. Yeah, lots of good Samaritans. Thank you, Griff. Our next guest was among a handful of the physicians on that train who rushed to the victims to rescue some of them inside the truck, pulling the injured to safety. All right, Senator Bill Cassidy joins us right now. Dr. Bill Cassidy. Senator, I know you've been through this, and I know it's still uh, fresh, but for our viewers, can you go through what goes through your mind as a doctor when you feel the impact of your train slamming into something? You're not sure what's happened. <clears throat> you first look to see that those people who are standing who fell are okay. You hear that we hit a truck, and I'm thinking to myself, we have doctors on board, but there's no doctor in that truck. And that truck got slammed harder than we. So I start to work to the back of the train looking for an open door. Uh, you go out, you see two people on the ground, uh, and you start to work. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Cassidy, your Senator Cassidy, your, your wife is a retired trauma surgeon. She was on board with you traveling. Um, both of you jumped off the train, I understand, and went to help. What did you see when you got to the truck? Because we're understanding, we're reporting that the passenger, one of the passengers, was killed. Yes, uh, I went down and I saw Mike Burgess and um, uh, Brad Winstrup trying to maintain an airway. Uh, the fellow had facial trauma, trying to keep his tongue out and, and again, maintain airway. Um, and I picked up his feet to try and get his blood going from his feet down to his heart and his brain. Uh, I looked to the right and there's a, a body there that looks like he's dead. But uh, Dr. Phil Rowe was there, a congressman from Tennessee, my wife approached and others. There's an attempt to Revived, but he was dead. I mean, that was pretty clear. And then we turned our attention back to, I never left my attention, but you, you kind of say, he's dead, focus here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Congressman Winstrom is one of the guys who tended to Steve Scalise at that uh, baseball practice not so long ago. Between that and this, how do you feel? This has been a heck of a year for you. Republicans. In it has been on the. It has been. I hate to say this, but all of us live as if our lives are going to be within two standard deviations of what it's normally. But most times, it's that way out in the distance that happens to us. And I've been a doctor long enough that it's not a surprise. It's not what you expect. But all of us can point to, wow, who would have thought that? But it changed a life or lost a life, mm -hmm. and that was one of these uh, instances. So, Senator, uh, there was a, this is a reporter on uh, CNN, a political commentator, that tweeted this out. A train carrying Republican members of Congress hits a truck near Charlottesville. Or is this a metaphor for American politics today? 
What's your reaction to that? Yeah. It is. Um, if we've gotten to the point in our society where you can't even be civil and, and, and understand there's a tragedy and a potentially worse tragedy and feel for that and as part of the human condition, something has died. And hopefully it can be reawakened. But whoever, Tim Kaine sent out something very nice, a Democratic senator, but sent a very nice tweet. Uh, that's good. Uh, if someone's sending something like that, they really have to reevaluate their spiritual state. Uh, something is wrong. Yeah. yeah, I mean, a loss of life. Their parents are grieving. The guy who was driving the truck, I'm sure, is so upset this morning. Um, real quickly, what happened in the situation? Do we know? Was the guy trying to, to beat the train? I'm, I'm told, yes, I'm told that most commonly there's long coal trains and folks get kind of impatient, so they, right. they're slow, so they try and get in front of them. And here comes the Amtrak, which is going faster. Mm -hmm. Not too fast, but faster. But that's what I'm told, not what I directly observed. Right. Well, and Congress, uh, Senator, before you go, uh, you were heading to and now you're at this Republican retreat in West Virginia. Are the activities that were scheduled yesterday still on tap? Is the vice president, uh, the president, still scheduled to speak to you later? Yes, the vice president spoke yesterday. The vice, the president will speak today. I'm told uh, secretaries uh, Mattis and Tillerson will speak, and so it's an important conference. We'll speak of infrastructure packages, so we don't want to be diverted from that. I think it's important to what we do in the Senate and the mm -hmm. House, uh, but we will have a constant remembrance of what happened yesterday. Yeah, you're going to a legislative cliff on February 6th, and you got something to do by March 5th. So there's no time even to look back. You got so much on your plate. Dr. Cassie, it's always great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. It is 6.30 now here in New York City. Coming up, people left dangling upside down on a roller coaster. Look at that, 70 feet in the air. Mm. How did that happen, yeah, and how did they get them off? Coming up. Plus, today's the day you'll start to see more money in your paycheck, thanks to President Trump's tax cuts. But Maxine Waters wants to give President Obama a lot of the credit. He attempts to take credit for economic growth, but refuses to acknowledge that he inherited our nation's thriving economy from our nation's first black president. I miss President Obama's tax cut. Where was I? Was I off that day? Hey, George. <laughs> He's next. Hey. posing with Corey Lewandowski, Sarah Sanders, and Dan Bongino, as well as Tucker Carlson. Smile. Uh, here I am behind the set getting ready. Right there, there we go. Getting ready with Jason Chaffetz. He joined us both days as well. Great guests. And this was our set, and this was uh, us reading those scripts cold. We keep those sh we keep the photographers way back. Speaking That's of what, cold, yes, yeah. And here we are wrapping up two jam-packed days with a fantastic group of, of great guests. And there we are, as well at the conclusion of the first day. See Trey Gowdy slightly pushing away there. He was signaling to us he's leaving the Congress. <laughs> <laughs> right, right there, right there. Like that. I didn't realize it. Stepping away. Yeah, it's like the Zapruder film. Meanwhile, here's, uh, not exactly, uh, here's Stuart Varney. He's the host of Varney and Company over in Fox Business. Good morning to you, sir. I was not with you in Washington, D.C. I'm like great wine. You had I to don't hold travel down the well. fort here. <laughs> you were yes, warm enough. I'm on Wall Street, okay? Uh, I handled I, money. All right. Okay. It was all about money on Capitol Hill. It yes, was. It was talking about the economy economy because you're in a business has wins and losses ups and downs and we have numbers why is it that so many Democrats are having trouble realizing that the economy is going up GDP is going up <laughs> and paychecks may be going up paychecks are going up as of this today. month as of today uh, because tax rates have come down paychecks will go up. So the, is that clear? So the federal government's going to be taking out less money? Yes, taking out less money. Let's, let's be very clear about this. Paychecks are going up because tax rates are going down. That's a, <laughs> a, a shall I repeat it? No. <laughs> let, me repeat, let me repeat what Nancy Pelosi has said three times. Yes. She said... In fact, you know what we did? We, put it, we recorded it on our VCR. <laughs> what does that mean? You're going to run a soundbite? Just push the, push the, the play reaction. button. Push the play, play button. button. This is actually the reaction from the vice president oh. because <laughs> Nancy amazing. Pelosi called it crumbs. Yeah. And our president said, these aren't crumbs. People have paying for their weddings. They're paying for their retirements. This is what the vice president had to say yesterday. It's just amazing to me that after this tax cut passes, 3 million Americans 
get another thousand dollars in their pockets in many cases. She actually described that as crumbs. Well, let me just remind you all, I, I come from the Joseph A. Bank wing of the West Wing. <laughs> Seriously, people stop me and say, is that a new suit? And I said, two for one. Uh, back when our kids were little, another thousand dollars in my pocket at the end of the year, I had a term for that, Christmas. Or maybe a new refrigerator, a down payment on the car. Any leader in America that would say $1,000 in the pockets of working families is crumbs is out of touch with the American people. Wow. That would be true. That would be very true. So it is true. Bonuses to 3 million Americans already paid largely, that is not crumbs. $1,000 or 500 bucks to a, an ordinary everyday American is not a crumb. And Nancy Pelosi is dead wrong when she says that 86 million middle class American families will see a pay, will, will see a tax increase because of this tax bill. Dead wrong, deliberately misleading the American The public. only thing I don't agree with him on that is, I think Joseph A. Banks is like, buy one, get three free. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good line. It was a great line. Uh, Stuart, and the crumbs don't even take into consideration with the tax cuts, a lot of corporations have more money in their pockets, and so what they're doing is they're buying new equipment, yep. they're expanding, they're hiring more people. But uh, there are a number of Democrats, though, who, and Brian kind of touched on this a moment ago, who are crediting President Obama for the roaring well, economy. Wait a second. Just let, let's look at the record for 2017. It was the best year for pay gains since uh, 2008 best year for pay gains in 10 years and look at the job situation in 2017 compared to the last year of president mm -hmm. obama there were 2.2 million more full-time jobs in 2017 under president trump and 300,000 fewer part-time jobs. How do you explain that? What does that tell you yeah. about the quality of job creation in America? 2017 Trump versus 2016 Mr. Obama. It tells you that the quality of job creation has improved enormously and pay is going up. That is President Trump. And it's President Trump because he reversed the policies of President Obama. It's a direct reversal. Right. This is the Trump economy, not the Obama economy. Case closed. And President Obama could have had that corporate tax cut. He knew it would fuel the economy, but he also wanted to rise the upper bracket. Look, look, look. And that's where the Republican Congress stood tall. His entire approach to the economy was radically different from President Trump. President Obama wanted to restrict it, rein it in, regulate it, tax it, mm -hmm. plan it, Organize it top down didn't work slow growth president trump take the regulations away lower taxes unleash the animal spirits of capitalism why are you laughing i never heard that term <laughs> animal, animal spirits. spirits yeah i like it hey uh, Stu, we're gonna watch it from nine to noon on fbn okay promise all right thank you i will be watching you. Thank you, all right thanks everyone all right, 20 minutes before the top of the hour, while we were down in D.C. freezing, uh, Jillian <laughs> was keeping the lights on for I'm us. very happy to have you guys back here, by the way. Welcome back, and good morning to you at home. Let's start with this. An MSNBC host slamming President Trump for highlighting the dangerous MS-13 gang at the State of the Union. He makes it sound like the biggest issue in the United States, uh, the biggest threat is MS-13, a gang nobody that doesn't watch Fox News has ever heard of. So Why'd he makes it sound that? like they are the biggest Why'd threat. Well, parents of two teens killed by the gang invited to the address, one of them now firing back at that host. I have no words. I mean, um, these are gang members that just, you know, decided to be a judge and a jury to take my daughter out like that. It's unacceptable. Many MS-13 members are also illegal immigrants. Three and a half minutes of complete panic. Insane video showing terrified passengers dangling upside down nearly 70 feet in the air, crying and screaming for help after a ride suddenly stops working. Officials at an Australian theme park say the safety operating system automatically engaged on the doomsday destroyer. It was back up and running within minutes and no one was hurt. A hero's homecoming uh, coming at a, as a complete shock to his family. Army specialist Tyler Hollandworth surprising his mom and two little brothers at their school in Missouri. They never saw this one coming. Oh! Oh my God! Oh my God! What the? 
Hollinsworth spent the last year stationed in South Korea. So look at your headlines, guys. Send it back to you. There's no place like home. Absolutely. All Is right, there a reality you. show about that? There needs to be a show where it just continuously does these <laughs> All the We're homecomings? All watching them, yeah. Well, right. we do a little episode every day. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's that's good. true. All right, thank uh, you, We Jillian. thank them for their yeah. service. Thanks, Jillian. The FBI doesn't want that FISA memo released, obviously, but President Trump says it's going to be. Let's release the memo. Oh, yeah. oh, don't worry. hundred percent. Judge, it's scratching their head. Judge, yeah. you said if they shade it, if Devin Nunes is shading it, what makes you think he is, or do you think he's shading raw intelligence, I, his I, political direction? I do not know that. My criticism of Congressman Nunes is they have known this for a year, and they sat on this while the Congress voted to expand FISA. The rest of the Congress should have been informed mm -hmm. of this before they voted yes or no on expanding FISA. When did this come out? Well, that, day that's, after, a, that's almost the, a separate issue. The though, day after right? President Trump signed it. Well, we've heard two versions. When we went to bed last night, we thought 6 o'clock tomorrow. Yeah. When I got up this morning, the stuff is, that I'm reading is saying 10 o'clock this morning. Right. So we don't know. We're, we're, we're sitting on pins and needles. Right. This better be as advertised. If this is being advertised as more than it is, we're wasting our time. Would they have to re-vote on it if they change the language? Ah, that's a very good question. That's what the Democrats on the committee are uh, saying, because the Republicans will have voted for something okay. that was right. different than what came out. But, right. but Judge, do you think the whole question is, do the FBI not want this out because it makes them look bad, or are they really worried about it misleading? Brian, that's the $64,000 question, and we don't know. My argument is, when you have raw data, raw intelligence data and there's several different interpretations we're adults release the data let us decide who abused spying authority right. who knew about it who looked the other way who's not doing what they were what they're paid to do we have the right to know that in a democracy take all the national intelligence stuff that we're not allowed to see all the 